This week, Elvis impersonators Kevin Costner and Kurt Russell had a casino heist in 3,000 miles to Graceland. Samuel L. Jackson deciphers a mysterious death in The Caveman's Valentine. And Brendan Fraser comes face to face with his own creations in Monkey Bone. You look good. You feel good? Yeah. Join your freedom. Yet. Kevin Costner and Kurt Russell are big Elvis fans with big guns in 3,000 Miles to Graceland, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Richard Roper, columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. If you took Oliver Stone's natural-born killers and clothed it in a white Elvis suit, you'd have 3,000 Miles to Graceland, an almost totally amoral and cheerfully violent video game of a movie. Kevin Costner and Kurt Russell are the leaders of a ruthless gang of outlaws who plan to rob the Riviera Casino in Vegas. These guys spend more time talking about all things Elvis than actually planning the heist. You said the king's down. Oh, come on, man. Let it go. Did I say something to you? So who said the king is down? Come on, man. We're just having a little fun back here. That's Christian Slater, who also had a special relationship with Elvis and True Romance in the back seat, along with David Arquette and Bokeem Woodbine. These guys are not geniuses, as the typical casino in Vegas is about as heavily guarded as Fort Knox. They're coming out. Do not engage on the floor. Direct from the section B-41 and intercept there. B-41. Russell is slightly less evil than Costner, so he's the nominal good guy here. That means he gets to have a romance with a conniving Courtney Cox. 911 yeah. operator, please state your name and the location of the emergency. Yes, hello. Hey! Hello. This is the 911 operator. Kevin Costner has played a killer before in A Perfect World, but that was a serious and intelligent character study, whereas 3,000 Miles to Graceland is pure, unrefined pulp with a big-name cast and a lot of pyrotechnics. It's kind of hard to care about these guys after they've murdered about a hundred innocent people in that casino robbery. But this film isn't concerned with developing sympathetic personalities. It's an aggressive thrill ride, and either you buy a ticket and enjoy it, or you walk out dizzy and nauseated. I actually found it to be a dark, hilarious, and kind of electric adventure. You liked it? I did like oh, it. Oh, my... I, I did didn't, like I it. I didn't care. Okay, well, then You know, you're case... all in or you're okay, not all okay. in with this baby. In that case, I'll forgive you for comparing it to Natural Born Killers which was a good movie, and I thought you were suggesting it was a bad movie, and this was a bad movie, but you think they're both good movies. I think Natural Born Killers is a good movie. I, I think, think it's this a lot is not better quite than... as good, but it has sort of the same kind of feel. It's got a not Tarantino quite. feel to it. Not quite. It's a lot better than this movie. I didn't like this movie at all, and one of the things I didn't like was the fact that the characterizations were completely inconsistent. What woman will give her son into the care and feeding of... A casino robber uh, and let him go off with the son just because she likes the guy and knows that he'll bring the son Well, back. he asks her that question and then she answers it because she's gotten to know him and she knows there's some good in the uh -huh, character. Uh-huh. Well, that's a real great motivation. And he, has, and he has a rapport with this little boy as much as he doesn't want to admit it. So Seemed to me okay. the movie was basically just all about behavior and about mannerisms and about uh, yeah. how people smoke and... Yeah. Uh, it didn't have any style. It didn't have any energy behind it to make me care one little bit about anyone in the movie. I thought it had tons of energy behind it. I mean, it's very funny at parts, too. I don't think it, at any level you're supposed to take this as a serious thing. They're robbing a casino in Vegas. You know that's going to go wrong. Ice-T comes in upside down with guns twirling in the middle of a shootout. That's a real good way to get killed. You know he's going to get shot. It's fun to watch it. Yeah, but you know, when you see stuff like that, you just realize that they just thought of it as they were writing the screenplay. Oh, let's have him come upside down and swirl around. And they executed so it beautifully. So what? I mean, after a while, you want to grow up and see a movie that's about something. And once in a while, you want to take a break from growing up and just enjoy a movie like this. Okay, our next movie is The Caveman's Valentine, the story of a homeless man who helped solve a murder. Samuel L. Jackson stars as a once brilliant musician now suffering from mental illness. He's technically, I guess, not homeless. He lives in a cave in a New York park but he remains far outside mainstream society, and when a body is found frozen near his cave, he becomes a crucial witness, and, fearing for his safety, he seeks shelter from a couple who has befriended him. This is a Bob and Betty festival. <laughs> <laughs> Can I propose a toast? Sure. To the eternal and, and, and everlasting cycle of failure and resuscitation. Here, here. The character named Romulus Ledbetter is drawn into the circle of a think? famous photographer played here by what Colm Lior. That photographer specializes in images of pain. The police have arrested a suspect, but is the photographer the real murderer? It's 
empty. Empty? Mm. So empty, it, 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 it hurts the eyes. You see, the angel is, is looking heavenward, but, but he can't see because Stuyvesant has sucked out his soul and just left his shell. He's empty. The challenge for Samuel Jackson here is to make the character convincingly insane and yet plausibly in touch. Jackson avoids the cliches of ranting and raving and shows a once brilliant mind struggling for control. There's a paradox here because a killer may be on the loose and no one will believe this man who they think is a lunatic. The Caveman's Valentine was directed by Casey Lemons, who made the brilliant Eve's Bayou a few years ago. This isn't in the same class, but it's unexpected and suspenseful. I liked it. I thought Lemons did a fantastic job of taking us inside the head of this very smart but deeply troubled guy. And you know, a lot of actors, you know, playing a homeless man is sort of like playing a drunk. Almost everybody wants, wants to tackle such a challenge. But I think Samuel L. Jackson does it without turning it into any kind of a gimmicky performance. Even his clothes, when they have close-ups on him, you can almost smell. In fact, a couple times characters are saying, oh, you smell so <laughs> yeah. bad because he really looks like a creature of the streets, a man of the streets, which is what he is. I almost would have preferred it if it hadn't been a murder mystery and just mm. been about this guy because Jackson does such a good job of making him obviously a complete outsider to society and yet at the same time mm -hmm. you can see the person inside who used to be there the brilliant musician the man who's who can still figure things out and right. who, who still cares about things even though he thinks he's being attacked by rays from the Chrysler building and yeah. has these visions the Chrysler building and is like the, a character in this yeah, movie i mean yeah. some really stunning but by visuals, the end of the film when he explains everything it's almost like the end of a Sherlock Holmes movie or i didn't a Columbo care episode. yeah okay yeah. you got it all figured yeah. out and this piece fits there and that piece fits there and by then for me the movie was over it's a really good movie but yeah. frankly i didn't much care about the ending because it was the characters that i cared about but the one good thing they did is they didn't make them all of a sudden get better we know that this character yeah. as he continues on is going to have a lot of trouble Coming up later in the show, Oscar nominee Julia Pinoche in her latest film, The Widow of St. Pierre. Coming up next, Bridget Fonda can't figure out what's up with boyfriend Brendan Fraser in Monkey Bone. Ow! I'm reporting this to my union. What union? The sidekicks union. Me, Tonto, Robin the Boy Wonder, Chewbacca. <laughs> Brendan Fraser is a cartoonist who has to literally confront his nightmares when he's plunged into a coma in Monkey Bone, an ambitious mix of live action, stop motion, and computer graphic animation. The bad news is that it's dreadful in all three formats. Fraser plays Stu, a mopey, psychologically fragile comic strip artist who is tormented by his alter ego, Monkey Bone, who's an unfunny and annoying little pest. Stu needs a golden exit pass to escape the hellish world of his coma, but Monkey Bone beats him to the punch. So now we've got Monkey Bone's obnoxious personality in Stu's body, while the real Stu tries to win a reprieve from death, played by Whoopi Goldberg. Why does everybody make it so hard for me? You're switching bodies. You're stealing exit passes. I work a long enough day as it is. Yeah, hey, look, you can take my soul. I, I don't need it. You can turn me into a paper doll, too. Just, just, please, just give me one hour. That's it. And just when I thought Monkey Bone couldn't possibly get worse, the inexplicable Chris Catan pops up as a dead gymnast whose body is occupied by the real stew, just as some corrupt doctors are harvesting his organs for the black market. What's wrong with my neck? You broke it! You're an organ donor! I'm sorry you had to see that, but don't blame me. Blame the makers of Monkey Bone for creating a depressingly grotesque and hopelessly juvenile comedy that contains not a single laugh, despite the presence of the charming Fraser and the talented Bridget Fonda. This is a shockingly bad effort with crude sets and flat animation and desperate performances from supporting characters Catan, Dave Foley, and Rose McGowan. Even with the likes of Double Take and Saving Silverman in the rearview mirror, Monkey Bone is hands down the worst comedy I've seen this year. Halfway through the thing, I was actually rooting for the projector to break. It's pretty bad, all right. Although I did think that when Chris Kattan was flying over the city and his organs, his liver and kidneys were falling out of his body and onto the barbecue grill. I don't know. There's just something twisted enough in my mind that I kind of smiled at those moments. But I agree Maybe with you. Maybe it's because you had been punched into submission this by an hour of unfunny complete, stuff. So the movie go, okay, is a complete dead zone. It was directed by Henry Selleck, who was really good at these kinds of movies. He made The Nightmare Before Christmas and James and the Giant Peach. Here, what kinds of movies every, would those well, be exactly? In other words, a combination of various right. kinds of live action, yeah. uh, stop motion special effects, and other kinds of uh, animation effects. And 
He can do it, but this time there's just nothing there. Just yeah. nothing there. And even nothing. but even on a technical level, didn't you think it looked really cheesy and cruddy? The you know coma land or whatever they call it. These characters walking around with like. You know, it looked like stuff from the Banana Splits TV show of like 30 <laughs> years ago. Oh, I've got a big head and a cyclops eye, and it doesn't blink. We didn't have enough money for yeah, that. It's those, just embarrassing. Those scenes were kind of underlit, I think, to conceal the fact that they were so shabby, and the so. whole movie is pretty shabby and should have been they much more underlit, underlit, than underlit the rest of it. Yeah. Okay, our next movie is another brilliant film by Patrice LeConte, who is one of my favorite directors. He made Monsieur Here about a peeping Tom and the hairdresser's husband about a man in love with women's hair. And The Girl on the Bridge, about a circus knife thrower. And now Daniel Otoy, who starred in that film, is back again with Oscar nominee Julia Pinoche in The Widow of St. Pierre. The movie is set in the 19th century in the French fishing islands off of Newfoundland, where Otoy is the local army captain, desperately in love with his wife, and they both oppose the execution. She n'a pas de guillotine, donc elle laissait partir. Tu as raison. Demain, j'irai ouvrir sa cellule et je lui dirai qu'il peut s'en aller. No one doubts the prisoner is guilty, but everyone on the island refuses to act as his executioner. Pourquoi vous faites cela? Parce que on n'a jamais le même quoi qu'on y fait. Les hommes peuvent être mauvais un jour et bon lendemain. Ils changent. Et de ça, je suis sûr. And the condemned man is played there by Yugoslavian film director Emil Kusturica. The Widow of St. Pierre is not some simple-minded argument against capital punishment, but diabolically complex in the way it shows Benoche hysterically, even sexually excited by this man's fate, and the way her husband loves and supports her, and the way being condemned to death is the best thing that ever happened to this man who acts to rehabilitate himself, becomes popular and admired, and even gets married. There's gallows humor, if you will, in the way the French governor can't find an executioner, and there's real poignancy in the way the prisoner escapes and then turns himself back in. And the period is poetically visualized. It's a beautiful film. I love this, The Widow of St. Pierre. It's utterly original, and it's brilliant. Well, it's not simple-minded, but it is one-sided, and for me, implausible. And I liked a lot of it, but not enough to recommend it, because this, uh, despite what you're saying, I think it is the land of the weepy liberals. And it's like, didn't anybody care about this captain who was murdered? by this darling prison. Isn't there anybody in this town who would rise up and say, hey, by the way, he killed that guy for no reason. And they all just sort of embrace him as if he's some sort of Christ-like figure. And Julia Pinoche, her character, okay, now her husband loves her desperately. Absolutely true. I think, you know, it, it desperately is a key word there because I don't think it's a balanced relationship. Yet this prisoner can touch her and hang out with her and he never says anything to the prisoner. So I found that to be very frustrating and very inconsistent. Well, the prisoner doesn't and these touch are weak her and... people. I think these are all very weak people. Well, now you're, you're getting into a character critique rather than a film critique. Well, I, I think mean, weakly drawn characters. Maybe it's a movie weak about people. weak people. But the thing is, first of all, Sure, he shouldn't have murdered this man. That's wrong. Everybody okay. agrees that's wrong. He was drunk. He didn't know what he was doing. All it right. happened by accident. Uh, he didn't mean to kill him. But nevertheless, Maybe. what it shows is that over a period of time, people cannot see themselves condemning him or, okay. or executing him. That's the point. Everybody thinks there should be capital punishment, but who wants to be the hangman? Fine. Nobody. Fine. Would you want to do it, you know? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to pull the lever on the guillotine. But she, while, by doing this, Julia Pinochet's character, by doing this, by supporting this man and throwing her lot in with not, this condemned killer, she's, it's not she, she's not, Roger, she's she not knows some liberal, some liberal who's supporting the condemned man. She's oh, yes, a woman she who was turned on by the fact that he's condemned to die. She's turned on by the fact that he committed it's a about, capital crime. No, she's fascinated no, by him before she ever meets him, looking at him through the window. Well, she's that's already see, fascinated that's what by Lacan is always doing. He always does this. His films are always yeah. about weird kinds of sexual obsession. Well, that's, and that's fine. what this is about. That's fine, but she knows by doing this, she's going to seal her own husband's fate, and she doesn't care she about doesn't that. She doesn't know that at the beginning. And that. nevertheless, at the end, they're standing side by side, and they both totally agree with the stand that they've taken. It didn't work for me. Okay, coming up next, this year's Oscar nominees provide the inspiration for our video picks of the week. Why are there medical records and blood samples in real estate files? Would you mind if I investigate this a little further? Ebert and Roper's Video Pick of the Week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. Try Raisinets in new, convenient, resealable bags. They're all signed. Every single one. 
How did you do this? Seeing as how I have no brains or legal expertise, I just went out there and performed 634 sexual favors. I'm really quite tired. That, of course, is a scene from Aaron Brockovich, one of this year's nominees for Best Picture. And although I didn't think the movie quite worked, I'm not here to knock it. Instead, on this expanded edition of our weekly video segment, we want to suggest some films you might rent if you especially like this year's nominees for picture, acting, or whatever. For example, if you happen to love Aaron Brockovich, you might want to watch Silkwood, Mike Nichols' 1983 film starring Meryl Streep as a worker who wants to blow the whistle on contamination at a nuclear fuel plant. How did that plutonium get in my house? Did you put it there? Did I what? What are you, crazy? In both films, you have based on fact stories about working class women without education or advantages who try to use the law to take on powerful and perhaps dangerous corporate criminals. I like Silkwood better than Aaron Brockovich. Although Meryl Streep and Cher were both nominated for Oscars, this isn't about star performances. It's more about the stories. Very natural performances from Streep and from Cher. Now, Best Actress Oscar nominee Julia Binoche and Lena Olin are wonderful in Best Picture nominee Chocolat. But their relationship is much more intriguing, complex, and erotic in The Unbearable Lightness of Being. This is Philip Kaufman's 1988 masterpiece starring Daniel Day-Lewis as a Don Juan-like surgeon in 1968 Prague who marries Binoche but can't stay away from other women, most prominently his longtime mistress, played by Owen. <laughs> With his casual amorality, Lewis is charming and infuriating. How can he not just treasure Juliette Binoche? But the most fascinating relationship in the film is between the waif-like, rosy-cheeked Binoche and the sexually confident Olin. The unbearable lightness of being is a daring and breathtaking flight of fancy that succeeds as a period take on the late 60s and as a love story dripping with sensuality. Boy, it sure does. And you know, Julia Binoche, who's also in The Widow of St. Pierre, just makes one good movie after another. That's right. Next nominee, let's say you love Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. What would be a good movie to rent in that case? Well, I could always recommend another great martial arts movie, but instead I want to focus on the Japanese film Kwai Don, which has two other qualities of Crouching Tiger. Breathtakingly beautiful visuals and the use of ancient Asian myths. Look at the beauty here in the segment, The Woman in the Snow, as the hero sets out on an ominous journey through a haunted woods, beckoned by the image of a beautiful woman, a ghost woman. Like Crouching Tiger, Kwai Dom was an Oscar nominee for Best Foreign Film. It's the kind of movie that once you've seen it, you want to share it with your friends. Coming up next, our video picks continue with movies linked to Gladiator and Traffic. Now here's another video recommendation based on one of this year's Best Picture nominees. If you like the sports arena deathmatch aspects of Gladiator, check out Rollerball with James Kahn as a super jock who excels at a game that's equal parts roller derby, motocross racing and raw blood sport. This 1975 release is set in the year 2018 when corporations rule the world and rollerball is the sport of the masses. Even though rollerball is set in a cold hard future, it has a retro feel, but the insight about powerful global corporations and the scenes of violent sport as entertainment, that all rings very true today. This is one of Khan's best performances, and it will be looming large over Chris Klein when he straps on the skates for the $80 million remake of Rollerball, which is opening this July. I know that director Norman Jewison feels Rollerball is one of his uh, overlooked great achievements. He's very proud of it. Yeah. The fifth best picture nominee this year is Traffic, and if you like that one, you might find points of comparison with Salvador, a terrific film made by Oliver Stone in 1986. This one also takes place partly in Latin America. It's also about drugs. It also involves unpleasant secrets about cooperation between American authorities and local lawbreakers. Take this, beat Don Mac cool, all right? James Woods and James Belushi co-star in Salvador. Woods was once a journalist, but is now basically a druggie looking to make some money and get his girlfriend out of the country. And Belushi is a fired DJ who came along for what he mistakenly thought was going to be a good time. Salvador resembles traffic in the way it implies that drugs are such big business that the people who fight them are surrounded by temptation and corruption. I'm glad you mentioned that film. I haven't seen it since it came out, but I remember loving it. James Belushi, his best role in this movie. You know, I think all of our recommendations average out about 15 years old. And so oftentimes when people go to video stores, they just want to see the new releases. They're not in touch with the history. Right. Even 1985 is history. Walk past the big wall of new releases and find these movies. We'll be back in a moment. 
Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. We split on 3,000 miles to Graceland. I thought it was a rockin' good time. Roger thought it was confused and shallow. Two thumbs up, though, for The Caveman's Valentine and Samuel L. Jackson. It opens next week. Two thumbs way down for The Dreadful Monkey Bone. But we split on The Widow of St. Pierre. I thought it was inconsistent, but Roger loved it. And if you have a choice between The Widow of St. Pierre and 3,000 Miles to Graceland, take my advice. But if you go see 3,000 Miles to Graceland, stick around for the credits because they're funny, too. Okay, remember you can hear our reviews on ebert robert moviescom and read us in print at suntimes.com. Next week, more new movies, including The Mexican, a romantic comedy starring Brad Pitt and Oscar nominee Julia Roberts. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.